Good evening, everyone. Today is June the 11th, 2024. You're here today for um, our Bible study lesson. Our six weeks um, topic is called and accountable, God's purpose for every believer. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you thanking you for allowing us to see another day. We thank you for just opening up our minds, just giving us your spiritual wisdom so that we can go out and apply your word in our everyday life and show others the goodness of you. Father God, it is all about you. This study is about you, and only you can grant us the wisdom and understanding of this lesson. So we pray today for all that are here and all that are, who are not here that you grant each of us wisdom so that we can understand your lesson. We ask because we know that if we ask you, you will grant it to us. So, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior name. Amen. Amen. Introduction. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you were seeking an answer to a question and once the answer was revealed, you are left with a sense of regret or sorrow. This is a common experience that we can reflect on as we explore into the topic of God's call and the believer's response. How do we respond when God calls, challenges our understanding, or asks us to make, diff make difficult choices? Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. And it says, someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked. And Jesus re replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. That was Matthew 19, verses 16 through 22. For the Christian to ask a question of God, the response must be, Yes, Lord. This rich man thought that he could gain eternal life. In verse 16, he asked Jesus, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Jesus told the man that he needed to keep God's commandments. When the man claimed to have kept the commandments, Jesus put his finger on the real issue, saying, Go, sell your belongings, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. The point to take away is not that this man would have earned eternal life if he had only been given, only been willing to give up his riches. We need to look deeper than that to the condition of this man's heart. The rich man did not come to Jesus humbly, willing to do and give whatever Jesus asked. If he had trusted Jesus, he would have gladly sold his possessions and given them to the poor. But his heart was proud and he clung to his possessions, so he walked away and let Jesus and Jesus let him go. This interaction with Jesus is a profound lesson for all of us, inviting us to examine our heart's true state and willingness to follow God's call. It is a transformative moment when you sense that God is calling you you have to say, yes, Lord. It is important to remember that you may want to say no, but you cannot say no, Lord, 
These two words are not just different, but they are completely opposite. If you say no, then he is no longer Lord. Lordship, by definition, always means yes. Even when you don't understand it, it still means yes. When Jesus is Lord, his servant always says, yes, Lord. This will bring us to the first part of our lesson and where we're going to talk about an awareness of God's call. In the world systems, there are some ways, there are some ways that you can take the initiative and make others aware of you. But in God's system, God always takes the initiative to make himself known first. God took the initiative to call you to become a child of God and a servant of Jesus Christ. And why wouldn't God call you first? He knows you better than you know yourself. Psalms 139, verse 1 through 18, and I'll read from the New Living Translation, those verses, Psalms 139, verses 1 through 18. And it says, O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the rings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me, knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was even born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Amen. Psalms 139, verses 1 through 18. In verse 1 of that psalm, the term search indicates a thorough examination. In other words, leaving no stone unturned. God has made every effort to know us. The term known expresses the result of searching. God knows our body every movement from our sitting to our rising. God knows our going out to our lying down, which covers all of our waking and sleeping hours. God knows even the unexpressed thoughts of our mind. God knows what we are going to say even before we say it. He knows when I'm, I'm traveling and stopping for a rest. God's knowledge goes beyond mere activity to my thoughts and my ways. God's comprehension is comprehensive, both around and over. Our ability to comprehend is limited. Such knowledge is beyond us. The question raised in verse 7 of Psalms 139 is whether or not I can ever be outside the presence of God. Psalms 139 verse 8 through 12 tells us no. Verse 8 does not merely say as for as the heavens you are there, as for the depths you are there. It says if. If contains a, if means on the vertical axis, neither a rise to heaven nor a descent to, into the grave 
will take me away from God's presence. Verse 9 through 10 states that neither a journey to the farthest east nor the farthest west will remove me from the presence of God. Verse 11 and 12 tells us, even if there was no light and I were engulfed in darkness, I could be, I could be hidden from the presence of God. For God's presence is not confined to the light. His presence exceeds the dark categories that we use for darkness and light. I can be nowhere where I am not in God's presence. God's thorough knowledge of me and his presence entails his precious care. This knowledge, presence, and care did not begin when I became an adult, an adolescent, or even a newborn baby. God's knowledge of me, presence with me, and care for me began before I was even born. Though I was hidden from human view in my mother's womb, I was not hidden from the view of God. Amen. His eye was on me, and I was in his thoughts from the beginning. When I was in the other seclusion of the womb, God was watching over my formation process. God cares about every minute detail of my body, for he formed the inner parts and wove them together when I was in my mother's womb. He cares about the fine details of my daily living, for each day and every moment of my yet-to-be-experienced life was already laid out by the plan of God. The precious thoughts God had about me in the process of forming me outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. They can be no more counted than comprehended. Now that we know God knows us and takes the initiative to call us to become children of God and servants of Jesus Christ, how is God calling us in our mission with him? When we first became Christians, we are baby Christians who must grow and learn to function with our spiritual family. Matthew 13, verses 10 through 23, the New Living Translation, Matthew 13, verses 10 through 23 says, his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people Long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seed. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their heart. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. Those scriptures were Matthew 13, verses 10 through 13. The disciples had asked, what is a parable and how do we understand parables? Jesus pointed to two purposes for the parables. 
First, Jesus revealed the truth to those who believed the mystery. So for those who trusted that Jesus was the promised king, the parables helped them to understand and become more aware of what kind of king, what kind of king he was and what kingdom Jesus was ushering in. However, the parables have a different purpose for those who reject Christ and refuse to see him as the Messiah. Oh, you can research all you want on the internet, but for those who reject Christ, Jesus said, it has not been given to them to understand these parables, and that even the understandings that they have would be taken away. Then in verse 13, Jesus tells us why he is doing these things. For this reason I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, and hearing they do not listen or understand. Jesus indicated to his disciples that since they had been called by God, they differed in several ways. First, your eyes are blessed because they do see, and your ears because they do hear. The disciples were greatly privileged to hear and understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. For this was, ev this was evidence of God's mercy. Jesus says, but your eyes are blessed because they do see, and your hear ears because they do hear. For I assure you, many prophets and righteous people long to see the things you see, yet didn't see them. To hear the things you hear, yet didn't hear them. God's grace is all over in this passage. To the disciples, it had been given to know these things. Given by who? By God. And more would be given by God. If we ask why the disciples understood and believed, while so many others didn't, the answer is that it was purely the mercy and grace of God. Have you ever wondered why you, as a follower of Christ, see forgiveness on the cross when so many others see foolishness? Is it because you are better, smarter, more religious? No, it is only because God is merciful. He has opened your eyes to see and your ears to hear. You are also blessed to live in a time when we have the full revelation of God's word as it points to Jesus Christ, something the Old Testament saints can only long for believers out right now also possess. The next part of, are the questions or comments before we go to the next part of our lesson. The next part of our lesson talks about spiritual senses. If I was to ask, what were your physical senses, what would you tell me? Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. All right. Did you know that you have spiritual senses that also parallel the physical senses? Let's go over those spiritual senses. First, the spiritual sense of sight. May I have a reader turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 and read verses 8 through 17. 2 Kings chapter 6 and read verses 8 through 17. We're talking about the spiritual sense of sight.
Thank you. And those verses were 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 17. In those verses, we see that Elijah was, Elijah was surrounded by a great army. He was not concerned, though, because he could see beyond the natural realm into the spiritual realm. He saw that there were more with him than against him. Seeing this gave him great confidence, courage, and faith. Elijah's servants could not see into this realm. He was fearful and despairing. Elijah prayed, Elijah prayed to the God that his servant eyes would open to see into the spiritual realm. As a result, this servant was given a spiritual vision enabling him to see the armies of God that were there to defend them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. Spiritual vision. The spiritual sense of seeing enables you to perceive and see in the spiritual realm. Mark chapter 8, verses 14 through 18 18 a says but the disciples had forgotten to bring any food they had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat as they were crossing the lake Jesus warned them watch out beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod at this they began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread Jesus knew what they were saying so he said why are you arguing about having no bread don't you know or understand even yet? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes. Can't you see? The disciples entered the boat with only one loaf of bread. Amazingly, with seven, with seven large baskets full, this is all that they could manage. They began to discuss their predicament. Perhaps they were even blaming one another. They failed to see the irony of the situation, and they forgot who was in the boat and what he could do. They don't get it and began, to, and began talking about having only one loaf of bread again. Jesus speaks of spiritual matters, but their minds were on the mundane matter. This kind of perception allows you to see the truth, to have your spiritual eyes open to understand the ways of the spirit. The Bible contains examples in which God's people saw a vision with their spiritual sense of seeing. Ezekiel saw the cherubim in Ezekiel 10 and the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. Daniel and John saw end times vision. Many other in the Bibles recorded their visions that they saw. As a believer in Jesus, you too can see in the spiritual realm. Questions or comments before we go through the spiritual sense of hearing. Next, there's the spiritual sense of hearing. Hearing God is so important to our relationship with him. But how can you enjoy a relationship with someone that you cannot communicate with? When we hear God, we draw close to him. We can then follow and obey him. John 10 and 27 tells us, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You can hear if you are listening. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you will grow in discernment. Psalms chapter 29, verses 3 through 9. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh like break of the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a cow. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discover the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. In other words, you can hear if you are listening. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and you will all grow in discernment. Listening, though, requires that you be in a position to hear. Luke 10, verse 38 through 42 tells us, 
as Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him, welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. Luke 10, verse 38 through 42. Jesus visits Martha's house. Martha's sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. Meanwhile, Martha was distracted by her many tasks. This is a real life situation in many churches where we have too many Marthas that concentrate on too much and do not sit and listen to the Lord. Mary prostrated herself at Jesus' feet and hung on to every word that he spoke while Martha was distracted with all the preparation. In Jesus' response, he says to all that in all your busyness, don't forget that the only one thing is necessary. That one thing is not the next tax on your to-do list. That one thing is not serving others. The only necessary thing is enjoying the Lord himself. 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 10. It says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very, were very rare, rare, and his visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not know, yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called out a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then, after three times, Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Has someone ever told you, shh, do you hear that? You answer, no, I don't hear anything. They reply, shh, listen. Then as you quieted, it, quieted your thoughts and concentrated on listening, you heard. Imagine being in a coffee shop, a mall, or a concert with your families or friends. All the noise around you is loud and distracting, but you can hear the person from across you or close to you. You can talk with them and carry on a full conversation. If you have children, you know what it's like to be able to pick out your child's call in a crowd saying, Daddy, when one of your children immediately causes us to turn to our kids, even if there are other kids and parents around. Why can we screen out our, our other voices and hear those we want to hear. In a word, it is focus. We focus on what we want to hear so we can pick it out. We give our attention to the voice that is more important amid all the other distractions. God longs for us to hear his voice. Sometimes our ears are un unable to hear him. Eli could no longer hear the voice of God or see God's work primarily because of sin. Eli can hear all the voice of all the others talking about the sins of his boys. He can hear others 
but due to his sin, he can no longer hear God. The story of Eli becomes the story of God's people in the book of Samuel. They, like he, need tend to listen to the wrong voice because of their sin. Modern people today may be in the company of Eli, may still be in the company of Eli, saying, I just don't hear him. I, don't, I just don't see him. That is understandable. Life is loud with phones, TVs, iPhones, iPads, music work, and other noises that can be make it difficult to discern God's still small voice. However, just because we do, may not hear God speaking right now does not mean that there is no God and that God does not speak. God still speaks, but some people cannot hear because they are unwilling to obey. Samuel willingly hears God's voice and obeys him, but Eli and his boys are unwilling to hear God's voice and they disobey him. Unwillingness may derive from selfishness, the fear of change, or even a general rebellion. However, unwillingness to obey God's voice will end up in disaster. Psalms 40 and 6, you take no delight in sacrifice sacrifices of offering. Now that you have made me listen, I finally understand you don't require burnt offering or sin offering. The primary organ for hearing God's revelation is not the eyes that see, but the ears that hear, which means that all of our reading of scripture must develop into a hearing of God. That's the hearing sense, spiritual hearing sense. Then we come to the spiritual sense of smelling. Leviticus 1 and 9 tell, 9b tells us, then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. In the Old Testament, priests sacrifice gifts and offering to the Lord on behalf of the people as an expression of worship and devotion to God. The scripture states that the aroma of the sacrifice was pleasing to God. Philippians 4, verses 15 through 18. It, the New Living Translation, Philippians 4, verses 15 through 18 says, As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you, brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. At the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me, gifts Aphrodite. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. What scent attracts you? I'm attracted to the smell of coming home and smelling good food cooking. <laughs> I'm also attracted to the smell of my wife's perfume. Paul used the language of sacrifice of worship all as a sweet smell. Just as the Old Testament sacrifice made a pleasing aroma, aroma that would ascend skyward, Paul says sacrificial giving pleases God. Sacrificial obedience is a pleasing aroma to God. This is why you should give faithfully because you want to please God. You should want to give because you want to worship him. We get to give, we get to worship, our offering pleases God. Your love for him today creates a sweet fragrance in the spirit. He loves your worship and he smells your love. Your spiritual senses are also your discerners. You can discern, discern both good and evil through the spiritual sense of smell. You probably heard the saying, saying, I smell a rat. In other words, the discerner is discerning that something not good is going on. For example, well, when someone professes to be a messenger of God, but their words don't reflect God, then your spiritual sense of smell will discern that you smell a rat. Questions or comments before we go through the spiritual sense of touching? The spiritual sense of touching. May I have a reader turn to Luke chapter 5 and read verses 12 through 13. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 13.
Thank you, my brother. Luke 5, 12 to 13. These verses reveal two things. First, the man had leprosy all over him. Leprosy is one of any of those several skin diseases. It sometimes results in op open sores and can also be contagious. This man was covered with it. Second, this man was in a town with a lot of people. According to the law of God, he should have been quarantined outside the city or camp. He was to be treated as unclean before God. The leprous man suffered a terrible condition. He suffered physical pain and social isolation. He was cut off from God in worship and Israel in the community. The law and the priests could not make this man clean. They could only determine and declare whether he was clean or not. They had no remedy or power to change a person's standing before God. In these verses, a man full of leprosy came to Jesus. No one can touch him without becoming unclean and also cut off from worship. To touch a leper was to be effectively to become a leper. This man cast himself on God when he says, Lord, if you are willing. And he shows faith in Jesus' power when he says, you can make me clean. Here's the wonders of the about the holiness of Jesus. First, Jesus actually touches the unclean. Jesus possesses a holiness that is not defiled by touching the unclean. But with a touch, he cleanses the unclean. Jesus possesses a holiness that produces what the law requires but cannot produce. Matthew 9, verses 20 through 22 also tells us about touching. Just then, Matthew 9, 20 through 22, it says, just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. That was Matthew 9, 20 through 22. Picture this. For 12 years, she had lived with this health problem, and no one had been able to help her. To add insult to injury, this was not just a physical problem, but it was also a spiritual problem. According to the Jewish law, this woman was ceremonial unclean, so she was not allowed to go to the temple and participate in the Jewish religious life. Certainly, she couldn't have had a social life since people could not touch her for fear of defilement. Yet, she believed that she would be made well if she could only touch Jesus' garment, which is exactly what she did. When Jesus was touched, he stopped immediately in the middle of the crowd. He looked, up at, he looked at the woman and said, Have courage, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Even in a crowd, Jesus gives hope in the midst of despair. You are not lost in the crowd before Jesus. He is intimately aware of every single detail of your life. In the middle of the crowd, he, you have his attention. Questions or sub comments on touch? Last sense, spiritual sense? Yes, the spiritual sense of tasting. <laughs> All right. You have probably heard people say, that situation left a bad taste in my mouth. They are not suggesting that they experienced a physical taste, but rather they had a negative encounter that left them with a bad taste, a perception or discernment. Job 6 and 30 says, is there, any, is there iniquity in my tongue? Cannot my taste discern perverse things? I am sure you have experienced a bitter taste after you heard someone speaking negatively or an, of another or when you walked into a room and there was a lot of cursing and bad language that was being used. I'm sure it left a bad taste in your mouth regarding that environment. In contrast, I'm sure you can relate to this scenario. 
after a really good devotion time, church service, or revival, when you are filled with his presence and glory, you might come out of the meeting and think, wow, that tasted good. It was satisfying and fulfilling. Psalms 34 and 8 tells us, A-A, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you develop your spiritual sense of tasting, you are awakening your discernment of good and evil. For example, the psalm said, psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The psalmist discovered that when he meditated on the words of the Lord, it made him feel good and satisfied. It was sweet like honey to him. You too can experience that good taste when the Lord is in your spirit. You too can participate in this good taste. Take a portion of scripture that brings delight to you, meditate on it, and allow the good taste of the Lord's word to fulfill you. Soak in this meditation until you feel satisfied, happy, and fulfilled. When you are truly familiar with the good taste of the Lord, it is easy to discern a counterfeit. For example, there's a local gas station restaurant here in Fort Valley where you can purchase chicken that tastes good when a particular person is cooking. If another, <laughs> if another person is there cooking, you know the difference in taste. <laughs> it is the same with the word. A Christian should know the difference between the taste of the word and the taste that does not have the Lord's taste in it. Not only does the Lord's word carry a sweet taste, but his presence does too. You can discern the presence of the Lord by tasting its fruit. Does the presence you are sensing bring pleasure and delight to you? Does it create reverence within your heart? Does it draw you closer to his love? Today's lesson discusses how am I called? We are called by being aware of God's call and developing our spiritual senses. Jeremiah 1, verse 4 through 10 says, The Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. The Lord replied, don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and will protect you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Then the Lord reached out and touched my mouth and said, Look, I have put my words in your mouth. Today I appoint you to stand up against nations and kingdoms. Some you must uproot and tear down, destroy and overthrow. Others you must build up and plant. Those verses were Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10. God's call on Jeremiah's life began by locating that calling before his birth. It shows that the moment of Jeremiah's call was not some sudden divine response to an immediate uh, unforeseen crisis, but simply the implementation in the presence of something long since planned for. Jeremiah's mission, therefore, was not his own freely chosen path of service, but a participation in a divine purpose that was being shaped in the mind of God before Jeremiah was being shaped in his mother's womb. Even the first verb that says, I formed you, speak of God's personal involvement. For it is the word regular used as a, as a potter shaping a vessel according to his own intention. For the moment, it spoke of God's intimate oversight of Jeremiah's individual biology. The verb, I knew you, indicates not just an intellectual awareness, but an act of personal commitment to a relationship. By making it clear, that this knowledge and choice had happened before his birth, God removed any, any grounds for Jeremiah to have any pride. The verb, I set you apart, is the same that is regularly used about Israel, about having been set apart by God for himself as a holy people. It is often translated as consecrated. Whether of people like the priests or things like sacred vessels, the central ideas of separation from the common realm for a purpose determined by God. God had identified Jeremiah and marked him out for this purpose before his birth. 
the verb I appointed you is not so much that God gives a, jo a job to Jeremiah, but it is that God gives Jeremiah to the job. Got that right? <laughs> All right. The message requires the messenger. Jeremiah is not a driven man, but Jeremiah is a given man. This was not a task that he had chosen, but a task for which God had chosen him. The initiative and all the verbs belong to God. We may not all be called to be prophets, but we are all called to be saints. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 tells us, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. God has a purpose in calling every one of us to himself. This concludes the lesson. Questions or comments? Yes, sir. conversation and Job didn't even know about it. And he didn't know what was being said, but God knew him. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Others? Yes, sir. Amen. He prepared you and given you everything you needed. Faithful and obedient. obedient. God, like you say, God uses anybody. He uses a stutterer. Moses is Moses. He uses um, a person is a shepherd boy. <laughs> he uses everybody for his purposes. And he uses us. We're talking about Old Testament figures, but God also uses us. Um, our job is to be willing and be obedient to whatever God wants us to be. Um, I remember Brother Zeke and some of the other brothers used to go to the prison ministry. And I was like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. But now that I have grown more, if I am called to go to the prison ministry, I know that he's already taken that fear from being behind some cells. He's taking that fear from, from me. Whatever he, you know, he's giving you, he's taking that fear from you. He prepared you. He prepared us too. Any others? Pastor? Comment? Yeah. All right. So. May the Lord watch between me and thee, while we're absent one from another. Amen.